And it looks like we are live. Uh, good evening to all of you in Jakarta. Uh, good whatever time it is for those of you uh, who are uh, attending this uh, Indonesian town hall from elsewhere. Uh, we're, we're doing this specifically for Indonesia today, but all are welcome. Uh, I am Bill Watson Canning. I'm the president of the University Consultants of America. Uh, and this is the second in a series of town halls that we started doing. Uh, normally we like to actually travel to Jakarta. Uh, if you have any awareness of anything going on in the world today, you know why we're not there right now. Uh, but these town halls we've been able to do uh, have really been sort of wonderful for us because there's just no way we could put together a panel uh, like we have today. Uh, so, uh, and it uh, looks like we have the, the rest of our panel even, even logging on right now. Uh, so we have the, the full suite of students and parents. Uh, and I'm going to pass it over uh, to my boss, uh, the CEO of University Consultants of America, Bob Levine, uh, to introduce everybody we have here today. Take it away, Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Good morning. Particularly for our friends, our students who are out in California, it's seven o'clock in the morning and they're still trying to figure out how to use their tech. Uh, we're very pleased to be doing these town hall meetings as well as all of our webinars. This is the second that we've done for Indonesia. So again, welcome Jakarta, welcome Surabaya, Bandung, um, Bali. I like vacationing in Bali. Um, I do want to introduce everybody. Uh, since he got into the frame last, I'm going to wake up Melvin. Um, mm -hmm. Melvin pretends to be in front of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. He is currently a graduate student at Stanford University, having graduated uh, from Georgia Tech. Uh, and so he can give you the perspective of the differences between the two, et cetera. Um, we also have Marisa. Uh, Marisa is uh, one of our UCA parents. Her uh, darling daughter, Fio, uh, is in the Claremont schools, and she can tell you all about what it's like to be a parent during this process. Perhaps uh, you will also get that perspective from Richard. Richard's son, Nico, is at NYU, at least last time we checked, and Richard certainly knows what it's like to navigate all of this from the parent's perspective. Johnson, Johnson's been a parent to pretty much every one of our Indonesian UCA students. Uh, he also has a daughter going to the University of Georgia, so he's lived it from your side, and he has a son. God love him for doing this again. Uh, of course, you know Bill. Bill's our president. Bill's a Princeton man. You may not yet know Hermann Hildo. Uh, Hermann Hildo is a Yaley, so um, we actually have a Harvard person, a Yale person, and a Princeton person, so if you want to talk smack and have fun. Um, but Hermes not all bad. He went to Harvard for graduate school, so that helps too. Redeeming uh, quality. <laughs> yes. Uh, Connor, Connor Brewer, um, another one of my all-time favorite students, is uh, somewhere in California having graduated from Stanford and is the author of an article published this month about the imperfect road to Stanford. So uh, you might want to read that. It's it's always great to hear the different perspectives. It just kind of really makes sense to everybody. And then we have Matthew. Matthew is uh, a student of the University of California system. Uh, he's at Davis. Uh, he can tell you the pluses and minuses and probably that all UCs are not the same. So uh, in your chat function at the bottom of your screen, uh, we urge you strongly, please, Ask questions, ask the hard questions, ask questions that you might think aren't deserving of being asked because the best part of this is being able to respond to you and allowing us to show you the different perspectives of uh, what we do. What else are we going to do? So like I said, we do a lot of webinars. So you know, and our families should know this already, uh, we have two more webinars coming up on Saturday. Uh, these will be nighttime for Indonesia. One will be directed towards those 12th graders who haven't really gotten around to writing anything, um, not our students, but if you know somebody who needs some help, here's a last minute shot to save yourself. And there'll be another directed towards the 10th graders and 11th graders and the families and parents to let you know what the changes are for your years so far 
and what you should be doing to make sure you've like going to the doctor, make sure you get a checkup. Format today will be that each of us will give two minutes, maybe three of our perspectives so that we have plenty of time for your questions. Um, we're gonna kind of bounce around between our UCA professionals and our parents and our students. I know that some of our, our young people actually have to do work stuff. So we wanna make sure we get them in uh, within the hour, uh, but we'll stay as long as it's appropriate to answer your questions. Uh, I'm gonna start off uh, with some stuff that I have learned or corroborated based upon some research I've done. Um, over the last month or two, I've been talking to an awful lot of admissions people, including several deans. And it was all done basically to grab quotes for an article that's being published. Um, but there's some really interesting things that come of that. You hear all the time that the American holistic system of admissions is really different than most of the world. It's really different from most of the world. And I want you to know a few things. Number one, this is an admissions office, not a rejection office. Their philosophy is to build communities. These people love people. They're trying to find good people, not reject those who are not good enough. That is their philosophy. What is perhaps most interesting is how frustrated they get because there are institutional requirements that have to do with money and diversity and what the board of trustees says. In fact, one um, admission person I interviewed told me about another officer in his office who is still complaining about a student that they had penciled into the class, but that the administration took out of the class. And this was six years ago. So they wanted to stress to everybody, please do not think of this as a judgment on your quality or on your parenting. They get frustrated too. Um, but perhaps the most astonishing thing is how they finally make their decision. It's a concept called reader love. They literally kind of fall in love. They embrace a student. Reader love happens in, um, well, I'll tell you where it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in your grades or your test scores or in your list of activities. It's not embraced in your resume. It tends to happen well in those essays or in the recommendation letters, the interviews, those soft points. And I wanna show you by sharing a screen and I hope you can see this. All right, this is what um, Sophia told me. Now, Sophia was my admissions rep when I volunteered with Harvard. And I asked her, what's most important? And she said, if I were to assign percentages to the impact of academics versus the other choices, especially for those schools who have the luxury of choosing whom they want, academics is at best 10% of the consideration. Check the academic box, then move on. What's the weight of that other 90%? And I think what you'll hear from our panelists today, particularly the students, um, is, and the parents too, is how nonlinear this process is. Yes, get good grades. Yes, get a good SAT score. Yes, do things that will change the world and lead everybody. But no, it doesn't stop there. It's a very different process. America is looking for contributors, not qualifications. So during the course of this evening's presentation, again, use that chat function and ask us some hard questions. And speaking of hard questions and hard experiences, I'm going to turn it over to Richard because he's not expecting me to turn it over to him. Uh, Richard, would you please share with everybody what it was like to go through September and October and November and December with your son, Nico, who finally, finally, finally did his work right. late. Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Bob. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, it was, um, I guess, a very um, uh, frustrating process for me. And also, uh, well, part of it because uh, even though I've been uh, I was educated in the U.S., but then the, it's so different from when I was there, and now uh, it places more uh, emphasis, you know, on uh, other things besides grades, 
and uh, I was an uh, engineer, educate engineering, but my son, Nico, is into writing, creative writing. So the requirements, everything is so different and it's very difficult for me to, uh, uh, to guide him sometimes. And uh, uh, that is where I think that, uh, you know, UCA was able to help Nico a lot. Uh, you know, first of all, by, by helping to select uh, the right uh, universities that is, that is, you know, that is uh, good for him, that is right for him also in guiding him how to do the essays. Um, for me, I guess the, the most frustrating experience was, uh, it's, you know, it's sometimes difficult for me to try to help Nico when there's some limitation uh, in myself uh, that, I, that I found that I cannot give 100%. And also, I guess, uh, Nico, I guess being, you know, he, he, he has a lot of other uh, extracurricular activities too. Um, uh, in terms of uh, submitting the works, the essays and things like that. Um, he's not a very, um, you know, he, he, he procrastinates a lot. <laughs> so, you know, assignments- Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. He procrastinates a lot. Now, Richard's not gonna tell the real story and I'm- of, of course, I, I know- I, I know will go to this. So. <laughs> We give out awards every year, really expensive awards. And one of our favorite awards, favorite, is most likely to make your parents crazy. <laughs> Nico had to put this on Richard's, around his neck. Because um, I'm pretty sure Richard wanted to put his hands around his son's neck. <laughs> or am I wrong? Well, no, um, it's not, not entirely wrong, no. But the thing is... Uh, <laughs> Because Nikos, you know, he wrote a lot. He, he wrote a lot, a lot of version of his essays, but then he keeps postponing submitting it uh, because he wants. He just wants to make it better and better and better. And but, uh, you know, th th there's a, th a deadline. You know, he 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 hasn't submitted. And you know, I I, I asked him to submit tr three times before I forced to submit it myself. <laughs> Using his son's name. <laughs> So, um, because otherwise, um, I, I was worried that nothing is going to progress, and uh, and because of that, I guess it's um, you know uh, things progress uh, well, I suppose. Well, he's doing pretty well at NYU, right? Uh, he is. He is. Uh, he is now um, uh, in sophomore, uh, fall semester now, sophomore. Uh, so far, uh, first year junior, uh, first year freshman, he's he got four point cumulative so very good question in hindsight what kind of advice would you give to your son or to the other parents and students about what it's like to go through ib in grade 12 at the same time you're doing the college work because i'm sure it's distracting yeah i think for my son i would say you know he needs to he needs to plan his time more uh, care uh, better uh, you know, uh, IP exams, uh, you know, it involves a lot of work. But then at the same time, you also need to get the applications and the, the essays done and submitted. I mean, Nico didn't only apply for U.S. universities, he also applies for U.K. universities. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of things going on. And plus he has to do his, his school project, uh, you know, and things like that. So uh, time management is very, very important. And... Uh, I guess Nico, he, he, he tried hard, but his time management needs a lot of improvements at that time, basically. <laughs> Teenagers, what are you going to do? Right. So right. Moving on uh, towards the left coast of the United States, uh, we're going to go towards uh, Ms. Connor Brewer. Uh, Connor used to have my favorite date of all time. November 17th. That's the day Connor walked into the office. Can we try to do Stanford? Uh-huh. Um, now, I, I do have to say that, that Bill's student from last year did get the record. He showed yeah. up on 23, December 23. So for those who are wondering, is it too late? Still October, but now would be a good time. But Connor, can you tell everybody what it was like, not only to do the process, but more importantly, what it was like when you got to Stanford. Yeah, absolutely. First off, 
Thank you, Bill. And I cannot believe someone has taken my record. But honestly, if it they came that late, they can keep that record because I thought <laughs> November was pretty late. Um, yeah, so I walked into Bill's office um, with a, the big dream to, to go to Stanford. And even more than that, I, I really wanted to go to California. And so um, I came to Bill asking like, hey, do you think it's realistic if I can apply to 14 schools and it's now late <laughs> November? And I think we can pull it off, right? And um, Bill did an amazing job of saying, well, if you're going to do this, you, you know, you're going to have to start with Stanford. It's the longest essay. Um, and I was like, are you crazy? I was going to put that off to be the last thing I did. Like, I don't want to start there. That's the most important one. And um, he helped walk me through and, you know, talk about how, you know, if he, he really helped me strategize in a way that I, I wouldn't have on my own. And so because it was the, the longest um, application, then I was able to use pieces of that to inform my other um, applications as well. And so he ended up saving me a lot of time when, when there wasn't too much time to spare. Um, and I remember Bill was so adamant telling me like, Connor, it's not just about grades and it's not just about, you know, these hardships. It's about really crafting who you are as a person. And so, um, part of our, my first, uh, few meetings with university consultants of America, they just talked, he talked me through, they kind of felt like, um, almost therapy sessions in a way of like, all right, well, let's really figure out what, who you are and what kind of picture you want to paint for these colleges, because, at the end of the day, they, they want to know what, what makes you, you and what you enjoy doing. And, um, which surprised me. I thought Bill would say, ask like, what am I most proud of? What have been the hardest challenges? And, and he did, and we talked about it, but um, it was really more of uh, who, who I was as a person. Um, and so I believed him and you know, we, did, we crafted this thing, but um, I didn't realize how strongly the colleges really felt about it. And so when I first got to Stanford um, and got in, which was crazy, um, I had a lot of uh, doubts. I was like, I can't believe how I like skated by and got in. And um, this was a huge shock. Um, and I felt a lot of imposter syndrome. And then um, when I got there during orientation, um, they sat all of the new Stanford students in a room and there were all kinds of whispers say, of all the students saying like, oh, I can't believe I, I got here. Like, I think I was the mistake. And um, that was kind of the, the vibe that was filling the whole auditorium at that point. And I was like, oh, I felt a little better because I wasn't the only one thinking that. Um, it's and, nice not to be the only mistake, right? It's nice not to be the only mistake. And so then the, the vice provost gets on stage and he's talking about... Um, uh, you know, what the community is going to be like and what the next four years will be like. But the thing he drove home the most was um, no one here was a mistake. And I was shocked. I was like, it's like he read my mind. He knew exactly what, <laughs> what to say in that moment. He started talking about, you know, some of my classmates' accomplishments and how um, there were Olympians and there were um, national spelling bee champions and there were science fair winners and there were all sorts of kids but um, not he didn't mention one thing about like oh this person got an, a perfect score on their ACT or this person had you know a 4.0 average the accomplishments and things he called out were um, really ways in which people had contributed beyond their their classroom and, and into the world and so um, it was nice to see then that th Stanford not only uh, <laughs> not only like really cared about um, you know things beyond, but when they were sh showcasing the the students they were really proud of to be admitting into this class, like they didn't say anything about um, grades. It was really more about that holistic person, and so that was the moment where it really drove home for me what Bill had been uh, talking about and insisting about for for months before as we were going through the process. Um, it's just not linear. Uh, now, Johnson has experienced this with what now feels like several hundred Indonesian students who worked with UCA. Um, Johnson, what do you think? Uh, do grades and test scores win every time? Well, I think more, in my opinion, it's more like personality. Um, having working with so many students now, you cannot tell, you know, which one has the... Um, the it, right? We call it the it to get in. Um, I mean, they're all bright. I mean, everybody's bright, but um, 
there are many times that you know, like when you see that students, like you know what, I, I think this guy will will make it because you, you know the, the the work ethic. Everybody has a different work ethic, right? Um, you have one one student that you don't have to tell anything; he will submit the the, the work way way before anybody else. Mm -hmm. And then you have another person that you have to chase around. Um, so, uh, having said that, I think the motivation comes first. Okay, and then and then you just have to show the work, right? I mean, you can be the most motivated person in the world, but if you don't show the work, then nothing will happen. You know? So, um, in my case as a parent, um, I think I ha I was in a similar boat like Richard. I came from the engineering background, so for me to write an essay is is a pain. <laughs> it's like a painful experience. You know that, Bob. It's painful um, so for everybody. <laughs> right. So I, 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 I knew since the beginning that I, there's, there's nothing I can do to help my daughter other than read it. Well, after I read it, then what? I, I don't think I can provide any, any input or fix it. Uh, but one thing that I can do well for her is managing her timeline. Okay. And then we're dealing with teenagers. Uh, we're dealing with um, students who have a lot of words, right, on their plate. Um, I just have to create her. I mean, I mean, I was a project manager in my previous job. So heck, heck I mean, I can set up a timeline for her, right? Um, we talk about this many times that there's a difference between due date and deadline, right? So what is the due date? The due date is the date when you submit the work. That's versus, high school. Right. Versus that line means, hey, I need this work by. So you need to submit this to us two weeks before, right? Not the day when it's due. Because if, if you submit it, let's say the application is due on January 1st and you submit the work on Jan December 31st, that means we, we're not working on that day. We, there's nothing we can do. So that's that mentality. We have to set it up to our students say, Pay attention on the date line, not the due date, right? Yeah, it's, that's a very good point because students are conditioned in high school or secondary school that there's a date you turn everything in. It's called the due date, and you think a deadline kind of is the same thing. Deadline is the end. It's when yeah. they're most tired. It's when you just finally showed up. Ooh, you apparently really want to go to our school. So we kind of force everybody to have earlier deadlines, not just so that they can – um, apply at the right time, but so that we have enough time to put the work together. Uh, now, um, Hermé, I'm going to jump over to you because something that Johnson said uh, kind of reminds me of what happens in the office all the time about, you know, I talked about reader love in the admissions office, and I think we get the same thing here as we start to see the students and, and see their work. Um, but talk about the, I know you have some other stuff you want to go over, but talk about the emotional side of how all of this works. Um, I, I think sometimes, you know, as, as much as Johnson kind of underlined or underscored the importance of timelines and keeping people on sort of project management mode, I think a lot of this is also sort of the emotional management piece with the parents, as well as, you know, the ups and downs of, you know, going through that process, making sure that your student is doing what they're doing, but sort of like, you know, are they on track? Are they going to get into the right schools? Am I making the right decision at this point in time? What about early admissions? I heard that this happened or I had heard that that happened and you hear that from various groups. You don't know what you're going to feel until you're in the process. So when you're in the process, you ha start having these highs and lows as parents and then students also don't realize how overwhelmed they will be with their own work. So they underestimate how much time an application does take and then how they may shut down mentally or emotionally so i think that you know part of this work is also that mentoring piece is also the helping the family through the work piece and just providing that additional support of being there being a thought partner um, and being a trusted voice um, so that they can cut through all of the other things that are stressors in their life speaking of stressors there's this covid thing trust me this class, the high school class of 2021, staring at each other across the table because you can't go to school, the stress is unbelievable. And one of the best comments that Hermé gave when he started was, I didn't realize how much family counseling is in this job. Am I right? Right. Okay. 
Um, all right, now we're going to move uh, back to the West Coast and get Mr. Matthew. Um, Matthew is um, currently at UC Davis. Uh, he's looking at transferring to some of the other UCs. Uh, having come uh, from Indonesia, he understands that America is a little different than Indonesia is and that there's an experience beyond the classroom that's important. So Matthew, tell us everybody about what you're experiencing, pluses and minuses. Okay, um, before I went to UC Davis, I had uh, quite a bit of options going to uh, Boston or New Jersey or even Minnesota, something that I haven't really thought of. Um, honestly, as an Indonesian, I would be more comfortable with uh, Indonesian people that are there. So uh, I picked my choice as either California or Boston. Um, Bob knows that I'm the person who would go out and uh, value cities more. And I thought that California were all like uh, Los, Los Angeles, you know, <laughs> like, so when I, when I went to Davis, I felt, I felt pretty shocked honestly, um, how the environment means a lot to me. Um, honestly, it's not bad, but it, it's just the preference, you know. Some, some people have different preferences, and uh, that really counts a lot. I always thought that rankings are always the most important things in looking at a university, but um, environment is up there, I would say. Well, actually, we think it's probably the overall number one thing is being in the right fit, because if you're happy, and you're inspired, you're just going to do well. Now, Matthew is, is being a little bit humble. He also got into UW. He did get into a lot of schools. Um, but one school isn't like another school. And we often hear, you know, looking at the Ivy League from Jakarta, I want to go to Cornell. I'm going to apply to Cornell. And my response is, Ithaca? When you come from a city of more than 10 million people, Ithaca's like 30,000. And look, there are actually three phases to the college experience. The last six months, as Connor and Melvin know, you're leaving the last semester. It's, you're looking for grad school. You're looking for a job. Take that out of the process. The first year and a half, you're kind of lost. You're finding your way. You're finding your friends, figuring things out. Then you have about two years for growth. Um, and I remember Connor saying to me, you ever heard of this school called Andover? Yeah, there's a lot of them out there. So you're just kind of finding your way, but then you get two years. And what I, I worry about for some, particularly those who are in the looking at business or the social sciences, is that there's not room off campus to grow. Uh, it's not gonna be everything you do, but it's gonna be a lot of it. And so when you look at a college town, it's a totally different experience. So an experience at Davis is gonna be very different than an experience at Irvine, just is. Um, anyway, I wanna hear from Marissa, who's got a daughter in SoCal, as we call it, because California kind of is two parts, NoCal and SoCal, and they're really different. Um, but I know that Fio's experience was really different too. So Marissa, tell us not only about what she went through, before and during college, but what you went through. Hello, good evening all. My name is Marisa. Uh, my daughter, Fiorin Wibawa, or usually goes by Fio, graduated from her high school, Ridley School, Jakarta, 2019. Like most uh, college applicants last year, we had quite a dilemma uh, on which university to choose uh, from her list, but eventually, we decided to go uh, with Pitzer College, a university in the Los Angeles area, uh, which is a part of uh, the five Claremont Colleges Consortium. And we were very excited at the idea of the tight-knit community and the uh, various opportunity in and out uh, school at Pitzer. Uh, however, um, her experience uh, in Pitzer uh, brought her up to uh, opportunity to uh, taking several classes uh, at another uh, member of the five uh, Claremont College, which is the CMC, Claremont McKenna. 
and uh, she became uh, very interested in their government major. And uh, Fio applied uh, to transfer uh, last spring uh, from Pitzer to CMC, and uh, she got uh, accepted for the fall semester. Uh, I remember uh, with all this experience, I really remember what Bob uh, said to us once um, last year that attending college in uh, Claremont will be a life changing experience for Fio, and it was indeed. Um, she grew in many aspects, even in the first 12 months of her college year, as she becomes more independent, uh, ambitious in a very good way, actually, and then uh, proactive and focused toward achieving her goals. Um, well, I guess uh, what I really want uh, to share with, her, um, with all the parents and students here is that in the process of uh, college admissions, you might have experienced lots of uh, ups and downs. But at every moment, please always remember that at the end of the day, everything that you have experienced is always um, part of a learning process that will truly shape you to become a better person. So, Basically, that was a summary about our experience. And uh, due to the current pandemic, Fio is currently here with us now. Uh, it's a crazy year, and she's taking all her classes uh, in Claremont McKenna online from Jakarta. Thank you. Back to you, Bob. Thank you so much. And for those who really don't know the Claremont schools, you have Pomona, Claremont McKenna, uh, Pitzer, and there's five schools. Um, that share. It's a very different experience giving you the small school experience, but really kind of a medium sized, almost Ivy League size experience. It's like five houses on a street that everybody plays at. Uh, doesn't have major college football, but it does have LA and right by the mountains and it's a great result. Um, for those who um, are interested, please remember to use the Q&A or chat function, ask questions. We're going to get to those in just a few minutes. I'm going to I uh, asked Bill to give some comments on some changes, and then we're going to get to good old Melvin, who uh, is in, woke up in Palo Alto this morning uh, and has been through the process for undergrad and grad school and see what he has to say. But first, let's take it over to Bill. Great. Thank you, uh, Bob. Uh, first of all, I, I understand some people are having to share logins. There's uh, some issues. Just please be aware that we are definitely recording this and we'll be uh, providing it to everybody. Afterwards, so you will get a link with the YouTube uh, YouTube video. Um, one question that we're seeing a lot already, which is exactly the topic that I usually cover in these calls, is, "Hey, what's up with the SAT? Is it required? Uh, you know, what's going on with standardized tests? Let's talk about standardized tests briefly. Um, first of all, why do American schools love standardized tests? Uh, well." Uh, there's a, uh, uh, schools are obviously gonna look at your academics. It is 10% how they're gonna consider you. They do wanna at least make sure you can do the work uh, at whatever school you are at. Uh, and here's the thing you'll discover. Every school uses sort of wildly different criteria for their grades, wildly different. There's a, a school not far away from uh, our office. Uh, I think it's a four point uh, grade scale and the valedictorian every year has something like a 9.2. Uh, GPA. Uh, not entirely sure how that's possible, but but hey, uh, when I was in high school, we had a 14-point scale. I don't know why. Uh, I never heard about that anywhere else. Um, some schools, uh, you're doing real well if you get a B. Other schools, if you get a B, uh, it is a conference with uh, the parents, the guidance counselor, uh, school psychiatrists, what have you. Uh, so universities are looking for some way to, uh, what's the word, standardize uh, their evaluation. Uh, of, of academic credentials across the board, and that's where the standardized tests come in. They have all sorts of flaws uh, that are sort of well known, doesn't take long to figure it out, but uh, at the very least, uh, they've been able to figure out that a student who scores a 1400 on a standardized test offered in March uh, performed at about the same level on that test as a student who got a 1400 in June, has got one in August, what have you. Uh, so the schools really do uh, like to look at those standardized tests uh, to, to at least sort of uh, 
what, validate uh, the GPA, uh, understand the GPA, uh, understand the academic potential across, uh, across the board. And let me interrupt and interject because when I uh, interviewed all these admissions people, because there's very few, well, pretty much every school here is test optional for this incoming, this season. Um, they were all a little worried because they've used that SAT for so long that they're gonna focus in so many cases on just essays and they're, they're kind of bummed. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because, uh, as Bob is alluding to, they're not gonna have as many standardized tests to look at this year because uh, there's a little uh, virus problem uh, that resulted in test dates being canceled. And by early April, pretty much every school in the United States had gone test optional. Uh, for the year, uh, mean they will not require you to have a test. I think uh, some of the military academies may still be requiring that, but but basically, uh, every school in the country is test optional. Except uh, the state of Florida. Uh, what that means uh, is that you are not required to submit a test score. That does not mean, in most cases, and I'll get to the exception in a second, uh, that does not mean uh, that they are test blind. Uh, if you are sitting there uh, with a 1550 test score, no, no admissions officer in the world is going to say, oh, I wish you hadn't shown me that. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, I wish I hadn't known that. No, they, they want that score. Uh, they, they, they want to see it. Um, test optional is not new. It is new at the scale it is this year. Uh, but test optional has existed. Uh, it, it was around back when I was applying to the college back in, I don't know, 1820 something. Um, the University of Chicago has been test optional for years. Wake Forest University in North Carolina has. Uh, Notre Dame has been test optional for international students. Uh, in fact, uh, we had a student from Jakarta last year uh, who is at Notre Dame now. Well, I'm not sure she's at Notre Dame now, given uh, issues, but she's enrolled in Notre Dame right now. Uh, uh, and she, she got in on the test optional plan. Test optional works very, very well historically. Uh, for students who are kind of exceptional across the board, but have some sort of, whether it's a test anxiety or whatever it is, uh, students whose test scores really do not match the rest of their portfolio. Uh, so we, we have seen that sort of strategy work. Um, but, but generally speaking, we do see test scores kind of track against GPA and, and what have you. Now, uh, if you were a 12th grader and you were not able to take the test because testing centers were canceling left and right because they couldn't get you know, either it wasn't safe to be open or they couldn't get uh, people to monitor. Uh, schools are prepared for you this year. Uh, if you are in 11th grade, do not expect that all these schools will be test optional next year. Testing centers are coming back. I know that there's still sort of last minute cancellation going on and stuff, but testing centers are coming back. And if you are in the high school class of 2022, uh, you should expect that you will probably need an SAT score. Uh, to apply to the schools that you are looking at. Uh, there is a possible exception here, uh, possible exception that's very popular I know uh, in Indonesia and really across uh, a lot of Asian countries, which is the University of California system. UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC Davis, where Mr. Pranata is. Uh, the UC system has announced they will be test optional through at least 2024 uh, and uh, likely uh, beyond that. Um, and in a recent court case, a uh, judge actually said that UC have to go, does have to go test blind, uh, at least for this year. Uh, that decision is being appealed uh, because these universities would still like to have that data point. Um, we don't know how that will shake out. Uh, again, if you're in 12th grade, it sort of is what it is at this point. Um, and, and hopefully the rest of your portfolio is there to uh, you know, sort of represent you well. Uh, but for 11th grade, uh, for students who are younger, uh, for right now, our advice is very, very strongly, uh, please do uh, plan to take that standardized test and, and plan to take it relatively early. Um, one thing that uh, when we first started working in Jakarta, we saw uh, were a lot of students uh, taking it for the first time ever uh, in October. Uh, and you are going up against uh, students in the United States who have been aware of standardized tests, well, have been aware of standardized tests since they're ridiculously young, uh, in some cases preparing for the SAT from seventh grade on. Uh, so if you come in at the last minute uh, and you're just sort of not familiar with how these tests work, uh, you may not get that score uh, that really represents you uh, the best.
best they can. Uh, so I know a number of students have been asking about it. Uh, sort of everybody knows about the test optional stuff this year, uh, but please do. Uh, if you have a good score, please plan to report it. Uh, and if you uh, are uh, not looking at this cycle, please plan to take the test. The, uh, this is the only year that I would ever say that there are times that we actually do recommend not reporting scores and it won't hurt you and sometimes it will help you because it is so strange for the admissions people this year you get a bit of a pass however there is no one rule even for a simple an individual student there are some schools that would like to see those scores uh, particularly if they're in or above the range of what they typically accept to give some comfort there are other schools that might be more in your reach category that if you don't quite have that great test score, you might not. One of the most important things to remember is there's no one rule for everything. There's no one rule on how a private university does what it does or a public university, which is usually different, or whether to report or not report. The bill's right. Um, for grade 12, you're kind of at the end, although we do know we have some taking December tests. Uh, but for grade 11, prepare. And if you need some help, we work with a lot of tutors who are excellent and proven. Look, in the US, uh, this is a big industry and there's a certain standard and our clients typically say that the students we recommend are really different and better. So reach out to us. So I'm gonna turn it now to Melvin, um, who has been anxiously awaiting because we woke him up and you know he wanted to say something. But um, Melvin, by the way, is one of the greatest guys you'll ever meet or maybe you won't meet, but you get to hear from him. Uh, he went to Georgia Tech undergrad. He went to, he's at Stanford right now for a master's in engineering management. So he's done, well, he's done two different sets of consultants, but he's also done applying to the public and private and going to a public and doing the same thing. Melvin, tell him what you've been through and particularly for those who are uh, perhaps our former students who are in undergrad, give them a sense of what the grad school thing is all about, same and different. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I spent four years at Georgia Tech uh, pursuing a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. And, um, you know, after uh, after graduating, I knew I sort of wanted to transition into business and management, but sort of keep my engineering mindset. And as a fresh grad, you know, um, an MBA really isn't, really isn't an option. So sort of had a, a couple of talks with Bob and team uh, to, to really figure out what it is um, I wanted. And um, they sort of helped me narrow down uh, the programs which led to Stanford's Masters of Management um, Science and Engineering, uh, where there's more of a mixture which, between engineering operations and business. So yeah, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions, um, like specific questions um, anyone may have, but you know, just to give a couple of brief pointers regarding these topics, um, I think one key difference is the role of diversity and how it affects the way you learn in graduate school. I think even though undergrads um, come from all over the world with many different upbringings, in graduate school, diversity sort of plays an even bigger role because you have classmates from all walks of life. And some fresh grads, other seasoned professionals, some married, others have children, and you know, students in general have a lot more experience. So a lot of the learning actually comes from discussions with each other, um, whether it is in class or outside of class. And I think on top of that, there's a lot more group work and projects because one of the goals of grad school is to sort of prepare you for a job in a related field. Uh, so you have to be comfortable with completing projects and presenting your field of study. So, I mean, quote unquote, uh, so, sort of soft skills matter more um, in, in these classes. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think those are just a couple of the key differences uh, between undergrad and grad school that I've noticed. Um, I think in terms of, you know, Georgia Tech being a public school and Stanford being a private school, um, I think certainly, you know, one of the topics that get that gets brought up often is about sort of student population and demographics, you know. I think the number of undergraduate students at Georgia Tech is actually roughly in the range of the total number of students at Stanford, so around 16,000. And, you know, as a public school, Georgia Tech needs a minimum number of in-state students. Uh, so, you know, classes tend to be bigger and you probably know more students from Georgia than anywhere else. Um, but at least in my experience, you know, Georgia Tech was pretty well organized. And so I haven't really noticed many differences uh, in actuality. Yeah. Well, it's interesting uh, what you said, because, uh, and I want to rephrase it and you tell me if I'm on the right track. It seems to me 
that uh, in the undergraduate experience, and particularly in the residential colleges, perhaps more so than, than when people get apartments, but the undergraduate experience is diverse and interactive, more socially, more outside the classroom. When you get into the graduate school experience, uh, particularly Bill and I went to an executive MBA program together, which is a range from 25 to 55, that the experience and the greater confidence, the, the interaction in the classroom is much more vital, robust, and fun. Is that your experience so far? I know you're doing online stuff right now. But... Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there, there, there was sort of quite, quite a big shift, I guess, in, in the way classes are run and, and um, a lot more discussion going on, which is sort of meaningful discussion because, because like you said, uh, the range of, of students um, it's just it's just quite it's much wider because of all the sort of experiences they've also built up, um, in addition to where they actually like originate from. Well, that that takes me back towards Connor, um, who's just finished the undergraduate experience and now is in the real world. Um, Stanford's a large place in terms of acreage. Got to use a lot of bicycles, but it's also a residential college. What was it like in terms of interacting in class and outside of class? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I really loved how Stanford was set up. So I think there, and Bob, jump in, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are kind of two types of ways, you know, colleges can kind of be set up. And so um, Stanford, like, uh, for example, NYU is kind of integrated into the city, whereas Stanford was um, cohesive in like, it had an outer barrier, it was its own kind of unit. Um, and in that way, it, I thought it was really wonderful experience for what my needs were because um, I enjoyed having it be this kind of blocked off community where actually all of the undergrads um, or the majority of the undergrads have uh, housing all four years. Um, and so everyone is on campus in that same location all four years. And Stanford even had a, a barber shop on campus and they had post office and they had like uh, the hospital. And so no one ever really left um, campus. And I think in a, a lot of ways, um, it created a really tight knit community through that because all of the freshmen were there. And so you were really forced to um, spend time with one another like in this uh, new shared community that no one had ever experienced and so um, on that level it was a kind of a fair playing field um, in which it wasn't like you were going to a, a new city or a new uh, local bar or anything like that where um, maybe someone was more familiar with it it was kind of like everyone was experiencing this all for the first time um, with that community so it, it created a really tight-knit um, group of students would your education have been the same if you didn't live there all four years? Hmm. Um, no, I, I don't think so. And, you know, I guess pros and cons to that, right? Like I'm now um, in a different city and I have no idea how to move around the city and interact with it. And so um, maybe I was spoiled being on campus all four years, but um, I think it really helped create um, tight, like close study groups in a way where um, maybe if I lived off campus with a certain group of people who maybe didn't have the same classes as me or didn't have the same major, it would have been harder to have um, those resources and those study groups. Um, whereas when I was on campus, um, everyone went in, well, I guess you can't go in person now to office hours, but everyone would go in person to office hours. You'd meet new people through that. Um, and you'd be able to have access to all the students all the time and so I, it'd be like 11 p.m. and I'd be biking uh, to the next dorm or residence to go study math um, with some friends and then maybe 12 p.m. or I guess 12 a.m. at that point um, I'd go and bike to the next residence and, and study physics and so everyone was so close and really accessible to be able to to help one another um, in our learning experience. Well, Connor thinks that biking to different dorms is close. At, at, at my alma mater and at Bill's and at Airmate, we walked. You see, for those who understand the size of an acre, Stanford's pretty big. It's called the farm because it used to be a farm. How big? 8,180 acres of land. Mm. So uh, that fit uh, that we talked about is really important in the sense that, you know, at an NYU, 
you just roll out into the coolest part of Manhattan. And we call that a city style campus. The buildings integrate with the city. We also kind of moving out from the epicenter, uh, describe what we call urban oasis. That's where you have a campus within a city. It is defined, so it's not just merged. Uh, think in terms of a Northeastern um, or a DePaul or perhaps a Columbia. As you get a little bit further, uh, we call it suburban, where there's transportation, you can get there, but you have your own space. A little further, um, you might call it kind of a commuter campus outside of Boston, places like Olin College of Engineering or Babson or Bentley, you get on a train to get to the subway, and then you have your college towns. And Palo Alto and Stanford are kind of a college town, University of Georgia and Athens, it's a big place, college town. I imagine Davis is something of a college town, so ask Matthew. Um, what's it like to be on a big public campus? And his microphone's not working. It's on mute. He just unmuted it. Try again. Nope, not working. Uh, we'll just say it this way. It's different. And the schools are all different. Um, but we want to get away from having to hear what we have to say to answering the questions that you have. And Bill's monitoring. And again, use the Q&A, use the chat function, and we're going to start answering. So Bill, what are we getting? We're getting a lot of questions about major. How do you choose what major? Do you apply into a major? Um, I, well, I know what it's like. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, well, let, 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 let me ask uh, those of you who've more recently been on a college campus. Uh, when you show up, does anybody come up to you and say, uh, you were required to be in such and such major because you checked some box back in the fall of your senior year? It's a very leading way of putting the question. Connor, what do you think? Did you know what you wanted to do when you got there? I changed my mind during week one of orientation. Um, so <laughs> Stanford didn't require me to, I think I put like some, the major I'd be interested in, but I wasn't, um, I didn't have to apply to a specific major or, or college within Stanford. Um, and I actually found out about a completely new major I didn't even know existed. Um, for, during orientation, one uh, a new girl in my dorm came up to me and, and told me about product design engineering. Um, I originally went in thinking I wanted to do mechanical um, and found that product design was a much better fit, more entrepreneurial. Um, but like I in high school, I didn't know that was an option, so I learned about something new when I when I got there and could easily uh, switch at Stanford. You could explore a lot of different majors there, and you weren't required to apply or, or switch. Um, like have a long process to switch to different ones. And, and for those in Indonesia, um, you apply to UK universities much more than we do in the US. And there tends to be this idea that the UK and the US are very similar. <laughs> oh, they're not. Uh, just like uh, IGCSC is a little bit different than IB, uh, the system in UK kind of wants you to know what you're doing. And so you're applying to a thing. And the US, eh, take two years and figure it out. Yes. There are places like an engineering school or a Wharton School of Business or uh, you know, being in a theater where you should know and you're applying to something specific. But our theory in the US is you figure it out as you go along and we give you time to taste and test from the world's largest educational uh, buffet line. Um, but uh, in fact- it, it, It's also not the case that a US major is a credential for your career in most cases. Obviously there are a few exceptions here and there, um, but I mean, I always point out my girlfriend's senior year of college is a religion major, she's now a surgeon. Um, it's, uh, and, uh, you know, you are, you are sort of preparing yourself for the, a way of thinking for the world that doesn't exist yet, uh, not checking a box so that you can uh, walk straight into a job somewhere. Well, in the case of Marisa's daughter, she didn't just change majors or change her mind, she changed schools. What was that like? I'm sure that was an interesting discussion. You want to do what? Yes, um, Pio was actually uh, calling us uh, around uh, spring, March uh, this year. And then uh, she uh, just tell us that uh, she would like to uh, try to apply uh, to Claremont McKenna because uh, she has uh, taken several classes uh, in government uh, major there. and. 
uh, she likes it so much, uh, the program and the uh, curriculum, I think. Uh, and then uh, she realized that uh, even though the perk of uh, uh, going to school in a consortium of uh, Claremont College uh, is you are able to take classes uh, in between those uh, five colleges. However, it mostly apply only for the freshman or probably sophomore years. Then after that, you won't be able to uh, in the upper classes. So that's what uh, I think uh, Maker really wants to transfer to uh, Claremont McKenna at that time. Yeah, it's it's a whole different thing. And, and we look at college as the bridge between being a youth and being an adult. And we look at the university as an opportunity to use resources to help to find yourself. Uh, Bill, what else are we getting from the audience? Uh, let's see. We are getting uh, we are getting several questions about whether uh, students should come to the U.S. for high school, say ninth, tenth, eleventh grade, uh, or whether it's better to apply uh, from Jakarta. I think the answer um, it depends. But, uh, it depends. Um, the truth is this: the ugly truth. There are certain feeder boarding schools where the students get a major advantage, and those of us who are college, and I'm, I'm guessing that Melvin's seen it too, all of us have seen it. There are certain schools that, yeah, it's an unfair advantage. So if your goal is to get one of the top 10 or 20 schools, those schools give you an advantage. It's not fair, but it's real. Um, however, there are pluses and minuses even for that. On the one hand, uh, I think that students who go to boarding schools grow up in kind of a different way because they're away from home, they're in a dormitory or residence hall, they're kind of immersed around other people, and it's a very supportive environment. But I wonder, is it as supportive as parents will be? Because ain't nobody gonna love a kid more than a parent. Also true, that ain't nobody gonna be an angry with a kid than a parent. Um, so it's a whole different dynamic, and I think the answer has to be a parental one uh, as much as it is a path decision. If the student is ready for that next development and you think it's the right thing for their development, sure, absolutely, consider a boarding school. Now, not all of them are gonna give you the same advantage. However, if the student needs something different, be a parent because it's gonna be 11, 12 hours difference and we know it, the, the students in high school, you're still kids, just like mold in a Petri dish maturation takes time and there's some things you can't see so this is a family decision as much as anything yes some will give an advantage but not all and you don't necessarily get an advantage by being in the u.s you'll get more information you can't avoid u.s college stuff here um, but it's a personal decision I often contribute and give back to my community, but I don't think it's something I can quantify or record. How do I show it on my application? Uh, I, I guess another way of saying that is, does every activity on your application have to be part of a formal organization? No. Uh, not really. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna toss it over uh, to Hermé. Um, question is. What do you do with great or not so great activities? Is the application designed to showcase things? Because for those who don't know, you get like 150 characters to describe some stuff you've done for 10 years. What has you've seen so far? With regard to how students showcase their activities? Well, their strategies and using the common application or whatever. Um, there's limited space and a limited review time. Uh, is there room and is it the type of thing that you can just do or does it require an art and science? Well, I mean, I think you probably should, um, those activities that you do should make sense that you can demonstrate your leadership in those activities and there should be some kind of showing some kind of a depth to and commitment to the activity. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like, I've done five hours every week, but it'd be nice if you could. Um, however, if you show the commitment to that activity and the depth that you've had in that activity, I think is more important than doing many activities, but there is an opportunity to showcase that in the application, yes. These colleges evaluate 
the non-intellectual activities, if you will, on four factors. How long you've done it, how well you've done it, what kind of an impact have you made and how far, and is it original or is everybody doing it? One of the funny things, funny in air quotes, is we have these really high achieving kids who do great on their essays and everybody's all stressed on the essay and then they throw together a list of activities that looks like a kindergartner did it in crayon. Um, there's, a, there's a certain criticality in how you present it. If the question is, can you? Absolutely, that's why they designed it and the US colleges really care about that. Um, but be careful on how you do it. And we got our students on to do that. And, and in our premier students, we help them edit it so that it looks as strong as it can be. Uh, we're getting a whole bunch of questions. Uh, my, my, my favorite is a uh, uh, variation on this is, will classes be live in the classroom in the fall of 2021? Um, so if anybody has been to the future and can tell us what's going on, please, uh, you know, uh, do let me know. I'm curious about a lot of things. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I said the umbrella question is, uh, with everything going on, it's still worth coming to the United States for study. And, and, and what do we sort of see as the advantages of the U.S. school of studying the U.S. specifically, uh, given that yeah. it's a little shut down still? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of ways to look at it. You look at the class as just a class, or you look at the education as an experience. Now, Melvin, I suppose you are doing a lot of things online because California is as locked down as any of our states. Um, is there still a quality education? And is it different being in Cali in terms of your educational experience than being in Jakarta? Um, so I, I think, you know, universities are, um, are very thoughtful about the situation. I think, I think they're, they're pretty well prepared. I think, especially over the summer, they, they sort of knew that, um, you know, things weren't gonna go back to normal uh, immediately and so i think um you know with these zoom courses and stuff they've they've, they've really thought about how they can adjust the course uh, accordingly it's, it's not really the same syllabus that they do offline they just bring it you know in, in a zoom platform and i think uh, as you mentioned it's sort of the um, it's it's an entire experience right? it's not just academically so 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 they do so they do emphasize and you know um, maybe utilizing breakout rooms um, to get some more interactions between between students before class um, and you know if you're on campus that there's still some you know some, some a, a bit of activity going on where you're still able to sort of interact with, with other students get to know them and um, so I think that there's still some value. Um, you know, certainly it, it was different from my um, sort of first couple of uh, quarters here, where, where everything was sort of you know open and all. But but you know, there's certainly some some value to it. I want to share with you all a WhatsApp I received from Aditya. Aditya was uh, fortunate enough to achieve both Harvard and MIT last year, but he's doing it online. One of the advice that we often give almost always, is for students to talk to the professors, to go to office hours, to try and talk to them as much as possible, a different one every week. Uh, so here's what he said. Oh, and I did your talking to a new professor every week thing. So I talked with this professor who's doing research on brain cancer, and she offered me a remote research position. Mm. He says, I'm just that charismatic. So yeah, thanks for that tip. Uh, the professors really want to work with you. And when you find the right school, they will find a way to get you something awesome. Um, anyway, we're getting a lot of questions. Uh, we are, uh, and uh, I'd say here's a good one uh, to, to throw open to people who might know more. How would you say the social interaction is different in the United States as opposed to Indonesia? <laughs> the answer may be it's not. <laughs> Well, uh, question we're, we're going to get with to Melvin on that one, but let's go with Johnson. Johnson's from Jakarta. He went to school at Oregon State, and then he went to Purdue, and then he went to Georgia Tech, and now he lives in Atlanta, but he's on WhatsApp all night long. We go back to Jakarta as much as possible, hoping in January again. Uh, I guess the question is, how different is U.S.? My quick answer is we're addicted to freedom. Just watch what we do. We're cray-cray in that regard. But Johnson, what's it like? And then Melvin, you tell him what it's like, because Matthew can't get his microphone on. Well, um, 
what I experienced 25 years ago may not relevant uh, today. It it may still, but I don't know. Maybe maybe Melvin or or Matt, you can 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 correct me if I'm wrong. Um, when I came to the U.S. in '92, um, you know, you you feel like, hey, I, I'm you're you're f so far away from the family, right? So you're trying to find as many as people as close that has a similar culture uh, mm -hmm. that you want to hang out with. So naturally, you will end up with hanging out with a bunch of Indonesian students. Um, so I think that's the norm. Um, but if you end up in one of those schools that, that, don't, that don't have many Indonesian students, <clears throat> you are forced to, to interact with other students from different countries. And I think that will be more beneficial rather than you know, just hang out with a bunch of Indonesian all the time. So there's a difference between um, going to the big school where you, you see more Indonesian students rather than, for example, um, McKenna. I, I don't know how many Indonesian students, probably like few. Um, in the old days, Ohio State, Oregon State, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, those, those state schools have a lot of Indonesian students, right? Compared to Stanford, for example, there are not many because it's very hard to get in or Harvard itself. Um, again, it's all about choices. Who do you want to hang out with, right? Um, if you feel that you want to learn as many as cultures, it's, it's, it's your advantage um, because there, there are so many, there are many schools that are so proud that, hey, we represent 150 countries, you know? They, they will never say in their, in, in their pamphlet, they, hey, we only represent 20 countries, <laughs> you know? So the more diversify, uh, the better. Um, so I, I guess um, if you say, is it much better? Um, is there any difference between the US and Indonesia? No, it's really up to you. I mean, you can experience as many as cultures that you want. So that's, that's my take. Yeah, it, it, it is personal preference and it does change. Um, we uh, have a student from China uh, from Hangzhou, actually. And uh, he decided to go to Washington and Lee, which is a small school, kind of in the middle of nowhere, but a very good school. Why? He didn't want to be around Chinese kids. Mm -hmm. Now, Melvin went to Georgia Tech, and I understand that Matthew's microphone is still on, so we'll get to him after Melvin. Uh, and I remember talking to him, and he said, you know, I kind of want to go somewhere where there's more diversity. I said, Melvin, you're in Atlanta. There's a lot of diversity there. I think what you're saying is you want to be around more Indonesians. And he's like, yeah. And just because it's the West Coast, you're naturally going to have more Asians on the West Coast. But contrast Georgia Tech and Stanford in terms of having people who look like you and eat the same food. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I think... Um my relationship with the Indonesian sort of students at Georgia Tech is, is, is slightly tighter than, than, than it is here. Um, so so it, it didn't really work out. Well, what you're saying is way. you want to get more Indonesian students and you've got fewer? Yeah, um, fewer and sort of more, um, more distant, but, but I guess it's, it's, it, it sort of resonates with, with what Johnson said earlier about sort of, you know, the sort of social circle you, you, you choose to be, to, to be in. And I think um, at Stanford, it, 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 there are a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of activities, a lot of diversity as well. And, and, and um, so I, I think um, it, yeah, it was, it was sort of, it was, it was quite different from, from my experience at, at, at Georgia Tech. So um, Matthew, um, you, you're thinking about changing from one school to another. Um, but I never heard you say that's because you felt uncomfortable with the student body or with the friends you made. So tell us a little bit about what it's like to be at UC Davis. Um, can you guys hear me now? Is my mic yep. working? Okay, so um, I've been trying to plan a transfer to from UC Davis to UCLA. Uh, firstly, uh, UCLA is a prestigious school, and that's still in the back of my mind, you know. 
the uh, second, there's actually no complaints about having friends in UC Davis and there's, there's not really a lot of problems. It's just, um, I feel like LA gives you a lot of opportunities. However, uh, after thinking through it, I actually researched a lot of clubs in UC Davis and a lot of opportunities that UC Davis actually has. Um, and it just makes me keep thinking about if I should transfer or not. Is um, Each university, I feel like there's a lot of opportunities that they have and it's about how you utilize them or not. Yeah, I mean, here in the state of Florida, the University of Florida, there are 983 student clubs. And that can be hard to navigate. Um, and so looking at the structure of a school, everything from a size to the design, because UC Irvine has a very different design architecturally, the way they lay out the whole campus, than does Davis or UCLA. Um, some of the differences between UCLA and Davis, just for your edification, um, one of them has weather that's a lot more like Indonesia. And one of them, the same one, has American football. And a lot of people go, ah, I don't really care. But then they're like, yeah, I kind of do want to understand that. All right. Anyway, uh, Bill, what's next? Uh, there's a bit of a, the, the queuing one up here for a common misconception we see, not just in Indonesia, but elsewhere. Uh, will going to community college first increase my chances to get accepted into a top U.S. university? Hermé, you want to start on that one? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I think there are back in, in cer certain places, such as California, there are back doors to major, some major universities. So it could be a possibility if you do not have a strong academic background right now, but as a strategy, and if you are strong uh, academically and otherwise, you should probably make a list that is going to be a good list for you in terms of fit and goals instead of trying the community college route first. Air, air is, air is too nice. I'm yeah. too nice. Too. It's a terrible we're not, strategy. We're not big fans. The advantage <laughs> basically is you save some money. It's in, in all situations, it's an inferior situation environmentally than being on campus with all the students. But know this, if you're looking to transfer, most, not all, but most U.S. universities would rather see you at a good four-year college, even if it doesn't have the same reputation, because they feel like you had a, a better educational experience and more educational challenge. You can't just say, we had a couple of years ago, had a girl from Jakarta and her mother's like, she has a chance of going to U Chicago. She should go to a two-year college in Chicago. No doesn't work that way. I know that's what is sold to you. In fact, the word college internationally is often considered to be just a two-year route and the four year is a university. No, the four year is university, excuse me, the four years college. University technically means undergrad plus graduate school, Stanford University, Harvard University. Um, but we're not big fans of the two-year route. Uh, it's like high school without the high school. And if you're going to send your students around the world to be all by themselves in a new environment with everything, eh, let's put it this way. The statistical odds for students who start in a two-year school and finish on time at a four-year school is like 7%. Just saying. Not our thing. Uh, we have, you know, it sounds like we have some people who uh, could, could actually use uh, some, sort of some of the basics. Uh, can we give you sort of broad overviews of the basic deadlines for submitting applications and scholarship in, information uh, for, for U.S. schools for, for students who just aren't, aren't aware of the basic timelines uh, for applying to, applying to these schools? Well, the U.S. schools, generally, it's the first semester of grade 12. Um, August 1st to January 1st, plus or minus a little bit. There are different plans, early versus regular, rolling, um, but it basically coincides with grade 12. Now, in the Cambridge Secondary School system, which is the UK system, IGCSE and all that good stuff, 
there is this idea that you can finish grade 10 and find your way into a U.S. university. Mm, that's not really our thing. Uh, most of the time, they're going to require a diploma. You can get a general equivalency diploma by taking a test, but I think that if you don't complete kind of the full range, you're at a significant disadvantage. Um, that's just the way it is. It's a different system. That system is designed for UK schools, and yeah, you can get there a little earlier. I'm not really a fan of going earlier anyway. Um, I'll ask the parents in the room about maturity of kids. From year to year throughout high school and now into college, Richard, has Nico grown up? Is he better able to learn the lessons now? Oh, yeah. Um, I definitely uh, noticed a lot of changes in him. Um, when he was still uh, here in Jakarta, um, you know, he will get distracted a lot, I guess, by games, by, you know, uh, his phones. But um, I, I noticed when he was there now, uh, most of the time when I call, he was either, um, you know, he, he, you know, he was uh, doing a lot of things outside school too. For example, joining clubs, writing clubs, uh, you know, uh, uh, submitting his, his writing for publication, things like that. Uh, not only that, uh, he also, uh, you know, he, be, because he was not as pampered there as here, I guess not pampered at all. So he, he, he does, he, he do everything, he does everything himself, you know, so everything from, you know, from finding an apartment, from, you know, uh, you know, getting food, uh, he even started learning how to cook, things like that, and managing his time better with, with classes, uh, you know, with, with uh, all the extra curricular works. Um, he and his friends actually um, started something uh, back home, you know, helping uh, local students to improve English also, while in the, well, well in New York right now. So, He's doing other stuff because uh, I guess part of the reason is because um, of COVID and he's not, you know, he, he couldn't go out that often. So he, he has to feel it, you know, some of the time doing other things. So definitely I, I, I uh, and when I talk to him, you know, about schoolwork, about, you know, how he's managing his life, uh, his tone and his, his point of view is very much different from what it is right, uh, before. So definitely uh, matured and grown up. I want to, before we get to Mercer, I want to give a, give a pat on the back to Matthew. Wait, what? Yes, Matthew. One of the things that we said at the time, and I want to say again, is that in grade 12, you matured a lot. It was just fun to watch. And we always tell the parents, particularly the boys, you're going to like your son way better at the end of grade 12 than you do now. It's kind of how it works. And, and that's true of Matthew. And you can see that as he goes to Davis and is considering transferring, but maybe not, there's a thought process that change. However, Matthew also has some cousins who are twins. They did not have that same maturity during grade 12. But as, as Johnson knows, and I know Matthew knows, it's amazing what's happened once they got into their university. In fact, Johnson, so that Matthew doesn't tout his own horn, tell us about the cousins, and how much better they're doing now at university. Johnson, you there? Yeah. Oh, oh I was asking you, man. Oh, asking me? Okay. Well, um, you remember the twins, right, Bob? Um, oh, sure. Actually, actually I remember um, the second meeting we had with mom, she was crying because uh, Jason got an F with the mock exam, right? You were looking to bring him to the US so we could watch him, it was that bad. Right, so, um, and, and then the next the next semester, I think he aced it. Um, so guess what? He's, he's doing pre-med right now in Chicago. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Somebody who almost, you know, failed one or a class, I, I couldn't remember which class, but now he's going to do pre-med. He loves Chicago so much that um, it's not about the school again. Um, I need to emphasize. I, I wish I, I learned about this long time ago when, when I started in college. Um, um, back to the earlier question, community college versus university. Um, when we talk about undergrad, four years undergrad, you're talking about your lifetime experience, right? The, the four years that you will never get back. 
Um, people may say high school is the best time of the of, of your life, but I think college, four year college is the time where you will mature the most because you you will meet new people that you will never meet before, right? That's why you do the networking that will help you to shape you up in, in the real world. So I don't think community college had the same ex uh, the same experience or offer the same um, advantage. So like like Jason, he's in Chicago. He he just he's like candy uh, a kid in a candy store because he wants to to take advantage of it, right? Versus me, when I was in Oregon, uh, I did nothing other than you know uh, I found a girlfriend, right? And then we just just two of us. <laughs> um, well, you married her. I, well, I married her eventually, right? But um, I didn't remember I, I joined this club, that club. Um, I just don't care. All I did is study and then dating. That's it. So again, it's um, I encourage people to take advantage of that four years in college. Um, now, now Melvin in, in in Stanford, you you've been sitting duck in one building, right? You don't go to any other building. That's what happened to me when I did my masters. I don't go to any other building. I'm stuck with my graduate school building um, all day. Um, so. Again, um, if you don't take advantage of that four years, you're missing it. Where are you? Difficulties in the office. Um, it, it, the question, one of the things we see in Indonesia, particularly in Jakarta, is the students are younger. A full year, maybe a year and a half, even two. Uh, those of us at UCA know uh, Rafael Brian Somali quite well. He is 18. Um, he is a third year student at UC Berkeley. And there are emotional struggles that um, these guys go to. So now I'm going to ask Marissa a question. Can you imagine Theo starting college a year younger? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would rather uh, to keep, well, before uh, going to high school, uh, when Theo was still in uh, junior high, we have a lot of discussion with different people, with family and friends, that uh, uh, we have an option of uh, putting her in a boarding school. But then uh, I just cannot imagine, uh, you know, probably it's because uh, the type of parent and the type of kids as well. So I don't think that it's for us uh, to put uh, like uh, the kids going to a boarding school before the prime age of going to uh, university so far away from her. Even when we uh, decide to send her to America, uh, one of the consideration that we have as parents is uh, at the end of the day, it's really not the how good the school is, but uh, for us, it's really more how safe the school is for the kids, uh, especially for the first few years. Yeah, and we, there's a lot of talk about gap years, and we've had students who've taken time off. And I got to tell you, as long as they use that time wisely, the gap year really improves their education and their maturity. And it feels like, no, I got to finish quicker. No, you have to finish better. Trust us. We've been working a long time. You'll be working for 40 years. The next year is not the difference. What is the difference is getting your traction, knowing what to do, instead of sliding around like a puppy on a polished floor. And so quicker is not better. And it's also no perfect rule on any of this. What's next, Bill? Uh, I would just want to do a really quick cleanup on some of the standardized test stuff, just because I'm seeing a lot of questions. What's a good score? You know, if, it, if it's only 10%, what's the rest? Um, uh, what's a good score? Higher is better. Always better to be higher than lower. Um, that 10% that stuff, uh, another way that we've heard it described sometimes by admissions officers is they look at the academic credentials for, uh, how many seconds did your MIT friend say? Uh, he said a third of a second. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at 15 seconds. Yeah, I'd, I'd say about 15. Uh, remember, this is not, you know, uh, your, your college admission is not a reward uh, for qualifications. It's a bet on your future. And so what they are doing when they are looking at your academic credentials is really quickly seeing if you are even capable of doing the work. Um, if you are somebody who's uh, had a steady stream of Ds and Fs uh, and your standardized test score is in the low 900s, 
Stanford's probably not going to come calling no matter how good the other 90% of your, of your application is. Um, but the other thing we see all the time just to stick with Stanford is they reject perfect test scores uh, all over the place. It is not like uh, you will see sometimes at, at uh, schools outside the United States. Uh, so fact, um, Patrick is there, uh, or is actually in Jakarta taking classes now. Um, he had a 1480 SAT. As a general rule, if it's an SAT 1500 and above, nobody's going to reject you at all. Uh, 35, 36 in the ACT, you're in the running. Or, or rather, I should say they're not going to reject you for that reason. They're not going to reject you for that reason. Uh, but that makes a really good point. So I'll ask um, Bill and Hermé, how many times do we st see students with perfect grades and perfect test scores? And all we can think of is, no, not going to work. Yeah. Too many times. Too many times. Um, it's, uh, uh, all, all you've done at that point is get yourself in the conversation, which matters. If you're not in the conversation at all, then you're, you're completely out of luck. But, um, but yeah, it's just, it's just the starting point. It's literally just the starting point. Uh, in the case of Stanford, they had a total of 12 essays until this year, plus two rec letters minimum, plus a report from the school, plus an interview report. That's 16 writings. After you've read 16 things that are either good or eh, nobody cares about your test score. In fact, there just isn't room for all the perfect test scores. It's not how it works at our private schools, more so at the public. Uh, but we do have a bunch of questions that I'll try and sort of aggregate together uh, under the sort of umbrella of which curriculum is best to take in high school. Uh, we've got students doing IBs, wondering how those IB scores matter, A-level tests. What if I'm at a national school on a national curriculum instead? Um, so um, I, I, I would say at the, the highest level, schools understand that the parent chooses the high school more than the student. Um, but, but let's talk about uh, what matters from the high school curriculum. Yes. Look at it more from a parent perspective than from a college perspective. If you develop the best person, you're going to develop the best applicant. The U.S. is well familiar with IB. They're very familiar with AP. A little less with the U.K. stuff, but we've heard of it. In fact, the admissions representatives that cover Indonesia cover Indonesia every year. They've heard about the national curriculum. They know. So they're going to look at the context of the curriculum as where the student's placed, but the performance of the student is all that matters. Um, uh, and I should also say a question about homeschooled students. They've also seen homeschooled students. Uh, this is, uh, um, all right. Uh, who should I ask to write my letters of recommendation? Well, that's an easy technical question. You're generally gonna need two in core classes that are relevant to your future. Um, generally, as recent as possible, grade 11 works pretty well, um, maybe grade 10. Um, but pick the ones who know you best because the best letters are the ones that are most personal. I, we sent to, and by the way, as part of our service, if the, if the schools or teachers wish, uh, we will edit teacher recommendation letters, not to change them, but to make them tighter, make them better flow. Um, in fact, I sent uh, one of our students' letters to Johnson yesterday. Um, Johnson, you remember reading that rec letter that we edited and, and just how it feels in terms of whether a school might want a student? Yeah, we always tell the parents and the students, you know, the best recommendation letter is almost like the parents writing it, right? You can never, but unfortunately you cannot have a parents writing their own kids recommendation letters. But if you know somebody who's close enough that understand, that can see the growth of the, the students, that, that will be the best. Um, not really who, who wrote it. Um, you, can have, you can have a letter from the president of the United States, but if the content is nothing, Oh, from well, that brings up a great story. Not one of our students, but a few years ago, a student applying to Georgetown University got a recommendation letter from the president or dean or whatever they call it of Georgetown University. She didn't get in. The person who wrote it didn't know her. A friend of a friend of a friend 
new here. So as a general rule, it is not about the caliber of the writer. It is about the caliber of the writing, mm -hmm. a great letter. And in fact, we have a student this year who's getting a recommendation letter from a teacher, but it's a teacher he's never had a class with. He thought the guy was a student and just, they started to become friends. And about three months later, he realized, you're a teacher? Yeah. And with one of the coolest recommendation letters, I'm writing a recommendation for a student I've never had. Mm -hmm. But so much personal back and forth. So very simply, you'll need to make them good because it's the last chapter of the book. It's the last thing they read before they make their decision. Lukewarm rec letters can be a problem. And when Brian asked me, because he didn't get everything he wanted, he showed me his recommendation letters after the process. He said, did they hurt me? I said, no, Brian, those recommendation letters didn't hurt you. It just didn't help you. Mm -hmm. It's really competitive. Yeah, you, you've seen so many letters that is very standard. Like the student is doing well in school, very attentive, but that's it. Well, that's the rest of the students either, right? But um, a lot of recommendation letters that we've seen over the years is the one that are interesting. I mean, um, that, that could make a difference. Well, and look, this is why we edit, because we often get uh, teachers writing letters that talk about all the extracurricular, co-curricular activities the student did that they've never seen. And that's the first thing. They're like, eh, you're not helping me much. So um, we want to help the teachers do a better job. We have things that will help the students work with the teachers, have the parents work with the teachers. We can work with the teachers. But we work with the teachers in several ways. What many don't know is that UCA provides free service to high schools. For example, we go into ACS as often as we can, and we will do it for anybody. So if you're a high school counselor out there and you want free help, whether it's a seminar of the kids, or we give seminars on how to write recommendation letters. We show you and give you PowerPoint and materials and examples, because that's really important. Uh, come on, a couple of questions here. Uh, is a bachelor's enough? Do you need a graduate degree? And what's the difference in the application for graduate school versus undergraduate? Better to have a good GPA from a lower ranked university or a mediocre GPA from a great university? Probably best is have a great GPA from a great university. First. Yeah, have a great GPA from a great university with a whole bunch of other stuff. And if you're at it, why don't you cure COVID? Because you're getting in everywhere. Please. Uh, the <laughs> grad school application process, we'll bring Melvin in for this. Um, it's different. Because it's more directed, you're supposed to know what you're doing. In the US undergrad process, they know that you're finding your way. And so they're looking kind of at a broader person as opposed to your direction. So the essays for grad school tend to be more like what undergrads are, would call a Y essay. Transfer apps are like that. UCAS for UK is like, why do you wanna go here? Which is about you, how you found your path, what you've done in your path and why it makes sense. But Melvin, um, you apply to a bunch of schools undergrad and then you apply to a bunch of schools grad school. Do you find the grad school experience, I don't wanna say simpler. Well, yes, yeah, simpler, fewer variations on essays, but deeper in terms of how you need to do those or what was your experience? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I think it was uh, a lot more straightforward. Um, and uh, I think in the essay itself, it, it, you could clearly see a flow and, and sort of an understanding of, of what my goals are. Um, both academically and professionally afterwards. Um, and I think uh, between the schools for um, when, when applying for grad school, the, the essays were were similar, um, but at the same time, like they dove deeper into each um, sort of curriculum and each program into, into sort of the, um, the pros and cons of each. Um, and so, yeah, completely resonate with, with what you said, Bob. Yeah, you got it right. But Bob, I think um, if I may share, um, I went straight for my, uh, for my graduate school after finished my undergrad. Uh, in a way, sometimes I regret it because I feel like I cannot contribute that much in the school, in the class, uh, especially when you have the open discussion class where you, you share your experience. I got nothing. Um, and, and that's very true. That's why MBA requires minimum two years experience uh, versus uh, engineering or technical degree, you usually can go straight from your undergrad. Um, but, but knowing myself, if I did not go straight from my undergrad, I will never go for my master's because I just don't like, to, I don't like school that much. 
Um, so something to consider whether you want to work well, first. Yeah, and to the extent that other, other countries kind of advance the process, uh, UK is you know, four years, including the master's. You know, the question was, do you need it? Do you need to go to graduate school? Steve Jobs didn't need it. Bill Gates mm -hmm. didn't need it. Mark Zuckerberg didn't need it. It's a personal question, but I will say this. Change your mindset about what graduate school can be. People who want to understand business don't necessarily need an MBA. There are incredible variations. I remember in my interview, they asked me, why did you look at a master's in marketing? I'm like, I don't know, because I didn't think it clearly. Melvin, however, did. You know, he finished, well, almost finished at Georgia Tech. And he said, yeah, I'm taking mechanical engineering. I don't want to be a mechanical engineer. So we had to look at different programs and they do vary a lot. And one of the advantages of Stanford is your opportunity to take graduate elective credits in the undergraduate experience. Um, so Melvin, how is it different learning mechanical engineering than getting a master's of science in engineering management or whatever it's called? Yeah, it's, 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 it's very different. Right? I think it's, it's sort of, um, it's, uh, it's, it's almost a pivot into a uh, sort of a different career path. And I, and I think, um, the, um, like you said, the range of opportunities, uh, in, in our masters to sort of cover some of the bases as well in, in, in computer science and in um, finance and all that it, it, it is possible. And, and I think, um, yeah, that was a, a key, key, um, a key difference. Whether um, undergrad or graduate school, our U.S. programs are different. The way they teach at MIT is not the way they teach 20 minute walk away at Harvard. And the way they teach at one graduate school is not the same. And one program is not the same. One of the things, and I'll, I'll throw it over to Bill because he actually finished his MBA. I started and couldn't take it, I guess. Um, a lot of our fellow students who had been business majors were looking forward to something that was in a different kind of depth and were frustrated. So I, there is repetition because the graduate schools don't assume that you, everybody starts the same place. What did you notice, Bill? Uh, well, I mean, it really sort of depends on the program. Yes, Bob and I were looking at an executive MBA, which is a, a sort of a generalist thing. Um, yeah, I sort of explain it as you might be in logistics, but uh, you were supposed to at least know something about how a marketing plan works, um, which can be frustrating for students who wanna go very, very deeply into how marketing plans work. Uh, in that sort of situation, uh, you, you need to sort of think carefully uh, about what, uh, you know, what the program is. The flip side is, uh, I had an earlier career in the theater, uh, got an MFA uh, in uh, drama from UC San Diego, um, and that was a situation where all I was doing was taking playwriting courses, essentially. If I wanted to learn about lighting design, well, no, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't the purpose there. Um, so, um, uh, you know, as opposed to the sort of undergraduate thing where, Kind of the whole purpose is to expose yourself broadly. Uh, graduate school, um, you're, you're, you're choosing a much more directed thing formally. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Hermione for a second. Because um, he went to Yale, got his business together at Haas, then went to Harvard for grad school. What was your experience in the pluses, minuses, pros, and cons, similarities, and differences between undergrad and grad? It was much, much more focused in, in graduate school, like Bill said. Um, well, my, and there are different programs, like I went to the Harvard School of Education, right? I got my educate, I got a master's degree, but it was in policy and management. So all the classes that I took were about policy, politics, managing, managing people, right? But focused in government. So it was a different experience, much more focused. But I would have to say that Harvard does a good job at creating a cohort experience. So it was similar to undergrad in many ways, um, in terms of people, diversity, opportunities, clubs, activities. It was robust in that sense. Fair enough. We have about 20 minutes before we really need to sign off. Bill, what else we got? Do I need a personal project to get into a top school? No. Oh, wait, did I just say that? Yeah, no. Uh, what you need when it comes to non-academic things 
is something good. And, you know, and that's one of the things about Connor and she's not here so I can brag on her a little bit. Uh, Connor was a state champion swimmer. She's also a type one diabetic and spent a lot of time in high school going around the country, explaining to younger type one diabetics how to live. In fact, one of her essays is about her insulin pump named Kevin. And yet she goes off to Stanford feeling like she's not all that. Uh, a personal project is very popular. So is going to a summer program. There is no one size fits all. But you do need quality performance in the classroom and outside the classroom. And this is where it gets very difficult. And where when we start with students a little younger, there's a bit of an advantage. Because when we start to show each student what works for each student. Um, the whole, and we see it a lot in Jakarta, the personal project. What that does is it does make you do something. And maybe it's great and maybe it's not, but it is not the box that you check that gets you into these schools. In fact, you can do a personal project, but after Stanford reads this year, nine essays plus the rest of stuff, eh, they don't really care. It is, you know, if, again, if you want to guarantee yourself, I don't know, be a cure cancer, or if your name, last name is Obama, you're kind of getting in anywhere you want. But for everybody else, there is no simple plan. Well, and it, it's, it's originality that the schools are looking for. And if you do what the same you know? thing that everybody else is doing, by definition, you're not original. Yeah, it's the nose on your face. You know it's there, you don't always see it. You want to be different? You want to be picked? You want to be selected because you're unique? Then you got to be unique. The personal project can do that, but there's always the wonder when the personal projects are a bit too complex. I kind of wonder who did it. Same thing is true with an NGO or what we call here in the US a 501c3. I created a charitable organization at age 14. Did you? Would you have some help with that? Uh, you mentioned summer programs a second ago, so let's segue over there. So I was asking about, uh, well, a sort of specific question about earning credits that can apply towards freshman year. I uh, don't know about that so much, but uh, also a question about whether summer program is a good way to uh, figure out if you might fit with a certain university. Um, for the purposes of this question, let's assume that these summer programs are once again open on campus, which they were not in 2020. If you could go to Stanford for the summer or two weeks, you think that everybody there is going to get into Stanford? This is more like a summer camp than a college experience. In most programs, you're dealing with other high schoolers. You're in the buildings, you see the campus, but that's not the student body and it's just a small portion. It can be very valuable or not. I think when students are younger, it's a valuable experience if they're mature enough to let them get away, get away from mom and dad, see a new environment, stretch themselves a little. I think that as they get, say, between age 10 and 11, grades 10 and 11, I should say, um, if there's something you can't do at home and you wanna go deep or try something new and they have it, Great, but as you get to 11 to 12, it's kind of a boxed prepaid thing. It doesn't prove that you've done anything well, it doesn't even prove that you went to the class, and it's not different than anything everybody else. It doesn't really tick the scale much. So to keep it simple, if it works for you, great. Don't expect it to work for your college thing because if, if it were even to check a box and everybody would do it, and it's not how it works. It could backfire too, remember Bob, we talk about this? Yeah, that's the thing. People like to go off to a school for the, you know, we had a guy from China in this case, um, go off to the University of Chicago, loved it. Got a recommendation letter from a professor for his class at Chicago. And here's how that works. Admissions office makes a phone call. Hey professor, yeah. Hey, we got this recommendation from you. Yeah, tell me about Yi Wei. Anyway, why I, never mind, thank you, Professor. You see, this is an opportunity for them to see you, for them to check you out in advance. Admissions offices generally spend between, for the best ones, five and 15 minutes total. If you're on their campus for a week or two, it's an audition. They're watching you. If you're gonna go off to a summer program and they're gonna watch you, let us prep you first. 
on how to do it. Don't just get a recommendation letter, create a relationship with the school. And it's really different. It definitely can backfire. And most people who do that, it does backfire. Uh, besides having a strong academic background, what do we encourage students to do? What are the suggestions on making the personal statement stand out? Well, for the personal statement, uh, again, we're having a, a webinar on Saturday. So after this, please, if you want information, we will send it to you. There are four foundational attributes of a great essay of any kind, actually a great communication, but definitely a personal statement. Here are the four. And if anybody tells you differently, they're wrong. I stake my reputation on it. Number one, the right message. Assume that you can communicate well. You better tell them what they're looking for. Not that's different than you, but they've got a grading sheet. You have to direct yourself to the grading sheet for the personal statement. That is who you are as a human being, both personally and interpersonally. They want to predict you in a community. They're not looking for a lone gunman. Don't be the only person in your essay. So. Number one, the right message. Number two, the right structure. The structure of War and Peace or Catcher in the Rye is designed for the reader. The structure of an encyclopedia is a little different. The instructions on how to build a bookcase from Ikea, a little different. There's a better structure and a lesser structure. For the personal statement, we recommend a tell, show, tell structure that's based upon a concept called the serial position effect, which is how humans remember stuff. But number one is the right message. Number two is the right not structure. Number three is detail. As we say here, detail wins. Detail allows a, a reader to visualize, so actually see in their head um, what you're trying to say. It allows them to understand it better, particularly when they're tired. It allows them to embrace it better. Think of detail as the clothing for the idea. As an example, if I say a word right now, you will probably see that. The word is camel. Does your camel have one hump or two? Detail wins. The difference between I bought my friend candy and I brought my friend Skittles and Kit Kats is remarkable in the reader's ability to just like you. And number four, voice, not grammar, not punctuation, not style, or syntax, or linking verbs. Voice, sound like you, be conversational, be real. I don't know how many times people say, well, it has to be perfect grammar. No, it doesn't. You're 17. The only class you have to take in college, usually writing. You're not supposed to be that good. And if you sound like a 59-year-old person, well, it just doesn't feel right. In fact, when Many U.S. universities start going away from the writing section of SAT. Bill's alma mater, Princeton, did something that was brilliant for them and maybe bad for you. Instead of taking this writing section, you had to turn in a graded paper. Well, your essays are normally really massaged, and if you have too much massage, too much polish, doesn't sound like the graded paper. So we try very, 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 very hard to keep the student's voice. Do we polish it up? Yes, but sometimes the ones that are just a little bit rough, the ones that haven't been overworked, the ones that don't look like a very expensive consultant has over massaged it, well, they just sound like, hey, this is actually a student talk and I like them better. Imagine after reading, and they do, several thousand essays, you get one that just sounds like a real human being. Thank you. But those are the big tips. There are some things to avoid, but if you want to know more, we have a free webinar on that. Which goes to just a, a, a couple of technical questions about, you know, contact information. Uh, I can give that Bob's personal phone number here, but I think instead what I'll say is that there will be a follow-up email here uh, with information about how you can sign up for a consultation with one of our client managers or if you have additional questions. Um, we will also make sure to provide information about Saturday's webinars uh, in, in that follow-up email that, like I say, goes out within 24 hours of I don't know if it's the start of the webinar or when we hit close, but you, you will certainly have that uh, in hand uh, within 24 hours. Um, looks like uh, we are coming to the end here. I can see uh, people are starting to log off, which I totally understand because it's getting towards 11 p.m. in Jakarta. Um, maybe the, the last question or uh, was one of the first ones we had, uh, what are sort of the three most important things I should be focusing on uh, if I want to 
achieve the universities I want. Let's take it from two points of view. Let's start with the parents and then we'll talk about from the student perspective. So Marisa, what, what would you say from a parent perspective is most important for a student, at least during the admissions process? During the admission process, I think um, you have uh, guided us with many uh, advice, Bob, but one of the most important in this case, I think uh, parents uh, and also students need to really understand that uh, as per what you say, uh, if it is not time yet, then it is not time yet. So don't, don't try to like, uh, try to push too hard uh, to go there uh, and then uh, having uh, so many like uh, difficulties in between, but just uh, take it easy and then uh, try to do your best and then try to learn, especially to manage your time. I think uh, that's probably the most important thing uh, that uh, <coughs> students and parents can focus in the next uh, several months. I know uh, they are going to get very busy after this. I'm guessing Richard would would also say time management, but I won't speak for you, sir. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, time management definitely is one of them. Um, but also, I think um, the most important uh, thing for, for, for us, at least for, at least for me, is uh, when I look back is how, uh, as a parent, we should work, I guess, collaboratively with our child or our children. Um, you know, how to uh, you know, how to help him and support him uh, to turn out the, the best work he can. Because um, sometimes, maybe because of the parent's personality, you know, or maybe they want to just to push uh, the child to do more. Uh, you know, sometimes there might be an adversarial kind of relationship. So I think the most important thing is how to understand uh, from their point of view, understand what they're going through and how you as a parent can support them and together with, uh, uh, with uh, UCA cell, how to uh, best, um, you know, uh, go through this process as painlessly as possible. I guess collaboration, uh, honest collaboration is most important. Yeah, and one thing that we know doesn't work, tiger bomb, helicopter parent. You can't force them to do anything. In fact, it's counterintuitive because the people get the best schools and people naturally do things on their own. What some people expect a consultancy to do is to handhold a child through a process. We don't do that. We don't handhold. Uh, we will support, we will direct, we will follow up, but we want the students to take ownership of the process, which is why one of the awards we give out is called the Stalker Award for the people who bother us the most. Is it annoying? Yeah, for about 10 seconds. What's most annoying are the ones we have to chase. Um, Johnson, what have you seen with so many students about what works and doesn't work in the process, whether it's the admissions process or the parenting process? Um, I think back to what Richard said is um, it's, it's all about collaboration among the parents, students, teacher, consultants. I mean, it's, it's a one team, one mission, right? Um, get the best fit school, not the best branding school. Because if, if the parents keep asking like, hey, what is, what's a good project for my, for my son or for my daughter? Well, basically the parent doesn't know the child very well. Um, if the parents know the child very well, then he, they should know that if, whether the son is, is self-motivated and can move on by himself. It doesn't have to be forced. Like, um, it, it's, it's very frustrating, especially, I, I mean, I'm in the same boat sometimes, you know, like watching my son playing games, you know, all summer, you know, even this COVID era, era he's still playing games. Uh, but that's what he enjoys, you know, that's what, and then, and many times that he will feel guilty, you know, like, hey, you know, um, did I play too much? Yeah, you play too much, right? But um, if I try to become a helicopter dad, and then, and this is the best reply for him, why don't you trust me? <laughs> you know, like when he say that word, you know, I, I have to step back and say, you know what, I guess I have to trust you, I have to learn how to trust you. 
Um, but at, at the end of the day, if you screw up, then it's on you, not on me. So again, it's, we have it's, a we have a client um, whose son is at a boarding school elsewhere. And he told me a story about how his son had made a mistake. And I talked to the guy, the kid, and he's like, yeah, that was on me. The school computer crashed. I couldn't get an assignment in. But if I'd done it earlier, I probably should do better on that. And I asked the dad, what would you tell him? He says, I got mad at him. I'm like, okay, what do you want from him? I want him to get into a good school and get good. No, wait, I just want him to be happy. I want him just to, I said, okay. If you treat your child like a child, they will act like one. If you treat them like an adult, they will be forced to become one. It's not about the verbal all the time. It's about the role model. That's what they see in parents. Um, but I want to give a, a shout out now to both Melvin and Matthew. Um, you got a chance to give one piece of advice to, uh, to our audience who are not just in Indonesia, but actually from all parts of the world, because we had some requests for that. So let's start with Matthew. Um, one piece of advice for the crowd. Give us your wisdom. Go. Uh, my advice is to do your research. That's, that's it. Um, um, you, I know that most people look at the rankings and all that school things, but then oh, what I learned from Bob was actually that uh, not everything comes from the rankings. And it's very important to actually look in depth to these uh, schools because these schools are, uh, you're gonna spend your time like four years in these schools. And it's very important to have the right environment for it. That's yeah, you're looking for an education, not a line item on a resume. Melvin, what do you think? You got one chance to make these people just do better in life. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but I guess um, what I'd say is, you know, I guess take some time for, for self-introspection, all right? So um, think about like who you are, where you want to be, um, and, and just continue self-improvement. Um, but I mean, you know, yeah. Well, that, that's actually uh, more poignant than you know when I was interviewing all these people, a wonderful quote from, from one admissions person. It's not about imp impressive writing. It's about impressive thought. And they are looking for that self-reflection. So um, Melvin and Matthew both know painfully that one question we always ask is, who are you? And the first time you answer that one, you don't answer at all. It's just horrific. But once you know that, it really helps you make better decisions. Well, I hope that uh, this evening has helped you all. We're gonna do this again and again. Um, hopefully we will be back in Indonesia in January or so. We're monitoring that situation as it is, but we will definitely have more Indonesian town halls. If there are topics you would like, let us know. If you would like us to give webinars in your school or to a group, let us know. These are not, there's no charge for this. We believe that a rising tide lifts all boats. And we came to Indonesia because Mr. Johnson Lee said, this is my homeland and I think this could help. So that's why we do this. Um, thank you all. Uh, if you do want to know more about Saturday's webinars, it's only two days away, again, contact us. If there are questions, contact us. That's why we're here. Thank you to everybody, particularly to our parents, to our students, and to all those of you who have been so patient and, and uh, interactive with your questions. It means a lot. From the United States, from the world headquarters of University Consultants of America in Tampa, Florida, an hour away from Disney World. I bid you adieu. Have a good night. And if you get a chance, when you can, use the MRT in Jakarta. The government paid money for that. Okay. Hope to see you soon. <laughs> Have a good night. Bye -bye.